All right, so um, today we're going to talk about uh, the difference again between fixed order quantity and fixed time period models. Um, sorry, I want to go ahead and get this. That will come on. Um, we want to identify how to determine safety stock when there's variability in demand. Actually, we did that on um, last Friday. We want to understand when to accept a price discount and when to reject a price discount. That's going to be the main thing that we do today, and that's going to be what's associated with your um, your 11C homework. Okay? And then we're going to discuss why inventory terms are related to order quantity and safety stock. And we're also going to talk about what an ABC inventory analysis is, which is a conceptual thing you'll need to know for the exam. Okay? So <clears throat> this is very familiar, right? We've seen this the last uh, two um, class periods. So again, we have these three inventory models. We have the, the single period model, the fixed order quantity model, and the fixed time period model. The single period model is the news vendor problem. And the fixed order quantity is where we use EOQ to calculate how much the ideal quantity to order would be. And then the fixed time period model is where we just do a review based on time period. Okay, there's a whole set of problems on the fixed time period model that we are not going to tackle in this class because I feel like you learn the basics of the trade-offs by going through um, the fixed order quantity model and there's just it just takes too much time to walk through those problems and add that to this set. So conceptually you need to know the difference between a fixed order quantity and a fixed time period but you're not going to be asked to do any fixed time period problems in terms of calculating how much to order. Okay. All right, again, very similar. We've seen the inventory costs. This will be the third time. So again, we've got holding or carrying costs, set up or production costs, ordering costs, and short shortage costs, right? And then we have, again, the third time, you've seen this difference between the fixed order quantity models, right? Also called the economic order quantity, EOQ or Q model, and they're event triggered, meaning when we hit a certain amount of inventory, that's going to trigger us to order more. Fixed time period, also called periodic system, periodic review system, fixed order interval system, and the P model are time triggered. <coughs> All right, so here's this comparison between, so this is kind of the new slide of the day, right? Fixed order quantity versus fixed time period, okay? In fixed order quantity, inventory remaining must be continually monitored. Every time you use inventory, you're checking to see, do I need to order more? Okay. It has a smaller average inventory because you're constantly checking and making a decision on when to order. It is more useful for more expensive items, right? Because you don't want to have larger inventories of more expensive items. It's more important, appropriate for more important items, and it requires more time to maintain, but it's usually more automated, and it's more expensive to implement for those very reasons that we just talked through. Okay. Fixed time period, on the other hand, you only take place, you count only at, during the review time period. So if I place an order every Monday or if I place an order on the 1st and the 15th of the month, I'm only checking that inventory typically on the 1st and the 15th of the month. So it's kind of a low budget maintenance. Um, it has, so because of that, you typically have a larger average inventory and it's more favorable to less expensive items because you're going to be carrying more of that inventory. It's sufficient for less important <coughs> items. Again, think screws, nuts, bolts, right? Those kinds of things that aren't that expensive. And so if you have an extra thousand, it's not, it doesn't break the bank. It requires less time to maintain and it's less expensive to implement. Okay, so that's kind of the, a good summary slide between the difference between fixed order quantity and fixed time period. And again, <coughs> If we're going to look at the specifics, if you looked at order quantity, your fixed order quantity model, Q, is identified when you calculate EOQ, and you're going to order the same amount each time. Okay? In a fixed time period model, it's small Q, and it's variable, and it varies each time the order is placed. So if I look today, because it's Monday, and maybe that's the time that I'm supposed to look, maybe I need to order 300. If I look next Monday, maybe I'll only need to order 200, but it can vary depending on what was used in the previous week, okay? Um, your reorder point with the Q model is when the inventory position hits a certain level, right? And your reorder point in the P model, or the fixed order time, is when you hit a particular day or time, right? Okay? Um, your record keeping. And the Q model, each time you withdraw or add, you have to update the record system, right? For the P model, you just update every during that review period. So if it's the 15th <coughs> of the month, that's the only time that I'm counting that inventory. 
Okay, size of inventory is less in the Q model than it is in the P model or the fixed order quantity model versus the fixed time period. Again, Q model takes more time to maintain and you put higher priced or more critical items in that Q model. Okay? <clears throat> so if we look at the process difference between the two, okay? In the Q model, our fixed order quantity, EOQ, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, well, if nothing's happening, we're just waiting for demand. And then when demand occurs, we withdraw um, from inventory or we back order if we don't have inventory on hand. We compute our inventory position, right? Is the position the reorder point? If it's not, we just go back and wait for the next time we have demand. And if it is, then we issue an order for our economic <coughs> Okay. On the other hand, in the fixed time period model, what happens is we are in an idle state and we wait for demand. Demand occurs and it's withdrawn from inventory or back order. And that cycle just continues to happen without us really having to do anything until the time for the review arrives. And then once the time for the review arrives, then we compute our position, we determine how much we need to order, and we order based on how many we've used since the last time we ordered. Okay? So, those three slides, those last three slides, are just really to get at the differences between your fixed order quantity and your fixed time period. And so, think EOQ, think um, time period. Okay? And you're going to want to make sure you're familiar with those differences. Right? And so, <coughs> the next kind of piece of our lecture today is we're going to talk about inventory models with price breaks. So what happens if my economic order quantity says that I want to order 500 or 552, but I get a price break if I order 600? How do I make that decision about what I'm going to order? Okay. <coughs> so, so we have to follow through on a couple of steps, right? And so we want to find, to find the lowest cost, we calculate the order quantity for each price, and we determine if that order quantity is feasible, okay? And then we sort prices from lowest to highest, we calculate the order quantity for each price until a feasible order quantity is found. If the first <coughs> feasible order quantity is the lowest price, this is best. Otherwise, we calculate the total cost for the first feasible quantity and calculate the total cost at each price lower than the first feasible order quantity. So let's just walk through what did we, what did we just say. Right? So we're given an example in our textbook, 11.8. Uh, Let me just take a minute and we'll read the background on what 11.8 says. Yeah, it says it's really detailed. It says consider the following case where actual demand, capital D, is equal to 10,000 units. Your setup or ordering costs are equal to $20 per order. Uh, the interest per carrying cost is 20%. Okay, your cost per unit varies depending on the quantity that you order. So we're given three options here. We can order anywhere between 1 and 499 units. Our cost per unit is $5. If I order between 500 and 999 units, it's four dollars and fifty cents. And if I order a thousand or more, it costs me three dollars and ninety cents. So the question of the day then is, well, what order quantity should we use? Okay. And so, if you recall, the previous slide said, well, you calculate what's your EOQ at each of these price points, right? So I'm going to run the EOQ formula up where it's got five dollars per unit cost, four fifty, and three ninety. Okay, so as I do that, and in this case, we know that our holding cost is made up of two components. It's the interest rate times the cost of the unit. Okay, so for 1 through 499, it's 2 times annual demand of 10,000 units, right, times $20 for our setup cost, divided by 20 cents, or excuse me, yeah, 20%, right, times $5, which is our unit cost at 1 through 499. And if you'll note, they make a little notation here to keep them honest, to say, this is my EOQ for 1 through 499 units, okay? And so that comes out to be 633. So the question is, is that a feasible EOQ or not? So for 1 through 499 units, I need to order 633. So is that in, our, is that in, our, in the range that we can order? It's not, right? I can only, up to 500, that's the applicable price. So if my EOQ is $6.33, or 
is 633 units and I'm going to get a lower price, why would I try to order it at a $5 price when I can get it at a $4.50 price? So we say, that one's not feasible. Let's go on and look at the next one. So the next one says that between 500 and 999 units, right, my economic order quantity is going to be 2 times 10,000 times $20 per order times my 20% times my cost of $4.50, so 667 Is that a feasible amount to order? It is, right? So I could say, okay, well, that's feasible, right? But I still don't know yet whether or not that's going to be the lowest possible cost. So I have to keep working through and looking at economic order quantity then for <clears throat> um, a thousand plus units, right, at a price of $3.90, two times 10,000 times 20 times my 20% times 390, right, is 716. Is that feasible? It's not because I have to, it says my economic order quantity is 716, but I have to order at least 1,000 to be able to get that price. So it's not a feasible, it's not in that feasible solution space, okay? And so I don't call it quits there. I say, well, then let me calculate, what if I order the minimum of 1,000, okay? What does that look like, okay? And so uh, we'd look at those costs as well. And so then we do the price breakdown. We don't look at 633 because we said that wasn't feasible. Right? And then if we look at our, if you remember, our total cost uh, formula. <coughs> our total annual cost is equal to our purchase price. I'll try to do it in their same sequence. Plus our holding cost. So my purchase price is going to be annual demand times cost, plus my holding cost is going to be my average inventory, which is going to be Q divided by 2, right, times my holding cost, which in this place we're substituting the interest rate times the cost per unit, okay, plus my setup costs, which are um, how many times a year I order, right, annual demand divided by Q times my setup costs, all right? So all they're doing here is they're breaking it out by each of those components, right? We're not worried about those solutions that aren't feasible. We don't have to figure a cost on those, but we do need to figure a cost on those solutions that are feasible. So at 667 units, I'm going to take 667 divided by 2, right? And I'm going to multiply it times my 20% interest times the cost of that unit. So at 667, I can purchase it at $4.50 per unit, okay? And again, they break it out just like this, right? This is how I do it, right? I go across the page, okay? And so I would say, we're gonna say our annual demand is 10,000 units times our cost of 450, plus our average inventory, which is 667, divided by 2 times my interest rate of 20% times my cost of 450 plus my annual demand of 10,000 units divided by my Q of 667 times my setup cost of 20. Okay? So this is my total annual cost at 667 units, where Q is equal to 667 units, okay? <coughs> and when we finish that out, right, we can see that our total cost is going to be 45,600. And when I continue and I look at my total annual cost, it doesn't make any sense to do 716 EOQ at a price of 390 because I have to purchase a minimum of 1,000. This is where some of you that are going to make a mistake, this is where you're going to make a mistake. Recognize that you have to go up to the minimum order quantity, right? So you're going to go from, if that's not a feasible solution, the next price, the, mo the most that you would order would be the lowest amount that you could order to get that price. Does that make sense? So if I have to order at least 1,000, then I'm going to do a total annual cost where Q is equal to 1,000, right? 
and then if you then uh, again ten thousand times my cost in this case is three ninety plus my order quantity. What's my order quantity in this one? <coughs> Thousand. Thousand. Divided by two times my twenty percent times my price of what? Three ninety. Three ninety. Plus ten thousand annual demand divided by Q of a thousand times twenty. And when I finish that up, the total cost there is going to be thirty-nine thousand five hundred and ninety. So what should my order quantity be? Thousand. I'm going to order in quantities of thousand. Okay. Here's the deal. If you, fill, if you do your formula this way, okay, what I typically do is I tell myself I have two variables to replace, right? Between here and here, I need to replace two Q's, right? And two costs. Okay? So when you move from this formula to this formula, you better make sure you're substituting it in four different places. Okay? And and I usually I say in my head two Q's and two U's because two Q's is the two quantities orders and two U's is the unit price. Okay, so you can in this case it's two Q's and two C's, but that's the that's how you keep yourself honest, right? And there's really no shortcut, right? You're going to be asked the problem and it's going to be a short question. What what quantity should you order in? Well, you have to figure the EOQs and determine if they're feasible or not. Right? And then for those that are feasible, then you have to calculate the total annual cost and make your decision based on that. Okay? <clears throat> All right, and this is just a visual, you know, for some of you that are visual learners, basically what it's saying is, okay, so if I were going to um, use the price of $5, right, my EOQ is 633, which is here, Right? But that's only for 0 to 500 units, and then I drop down right, from 500 to 999 to this price range. So that means that that EOQ isn't in the feasible range. Okay? Then I calculate my EOQ for $4.50, right? and it is in the feasible range. So I can use that to calculate total annual costs, which we did. Right? Or if I look at where I calculated it for uh, the price of $3.90, okay? That's not in the feasible range because I have to order at least a thousand units, right? So I'm going to order, so I'm going to have to do my total annual cost to look at a thousand units and say whether or not that's whether or not which is the lowest total cost. Okay? That's all they're trying to do there: show us that visual. Any questions about this? We understand. I mean, we looked at total annual cost on Friday. I did another review of it today. Again, it's it's knowing. You got to write the equation. You got to calculate the EOQs. And you've got to run the total annual costs. Kyle. So, I'm just trying to figure out. Wouldn't if you ordered in costs of a thousand or in the quantities of a thousand, wouldn't that also rack up your holding costs since you're ordering 400 more than you actually need? Yes, it does. And so the question is, is your is the price discount that you're going to get by purchasing a thousand? greater, is that a better benefit to you than the extra holding costs that you're going to get? So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so when you're at an EOQ like you are at 667, you're going to calculate your holding costs and your setup costs and they're going to equal because you're at an EOQ. What happens when you can't do it at an EOQ but you have to go to a minimum, right, your holding costs are going to be larger than your setup costs. And the question is, are they are they, is the price discount that you're receiving a larger benefit than that increase from your holding costs, right? And that's going to be, that's what drives the decision on whether or not you're going to actually take the price discount or not. Okay? Good question. Any others before we go on? All right, we, conceptually we're going to talk about ABC classification of inventory. Um, and this is a, an inventory classification method that many organizations use and if you think about it, it it's a pretty common sense approach to it because um, what and it, when you're doing inventory control you go out and you do uh, cycle counts right you go out and count how much inventory is actually out there and compare it to your books and see does it match or not right 
And if it does, everybody says hallelujah. And if it doesn't, you have to do a reconciliation. And if you're really off in the, in the pellet world, that means that you're going to take a beating because your inventory numbers are off and they're not happy with you, right? They want you to have accurate inventory, okay? But the bottom line is some inventory matters more than others, okay? So if uh, vinyl is, um, I don't know whether it's 20 or 30% of the total cost of the window and the glass is probably another 20% of the cost of the window, right? Those are two pretty big components. And those are high inventory dollar items. So I want to make sure that I'm accurate on those, right? But on screws, nuts, and bolts, if I'm off by 20, who cares, right? You know, you're only talking $2, right? In the grand scheme of the Pella organization, that's not a big deal. So you, you do a, a common sense approach to classifying your inventory so that you're identifying where it makes sense to spend your resources at, right? Because I don't want my stock keepers out counting screws every day. There's no sense in that. It's not, it's not value added. But I want to make sure that, my, that the more expensive items are counted more often. So we classify things into what we call A, B, and C classifications. A being the most important, B being the next most important, and C being the least important. And so from the Pella world, what we would do is we would count every A item in the facility once a week to make sure that our inventory was accurate there. If it wasn't, we had to do the reconciliation and figure out where did we go astray. Usually there's some counseling involved because it's a big deal, right? It's a lot of inventory. So, and then on the B items, maybe you only count those once a month. Right? They're important, but they're not, that, they're not that critical or they're not items that you've been having trouble with. And C items, maybe you only count those once a quarter. So you go into your inventory system and you code every part number as an A, B, or C item. And then what happens is you have uh, your MRP system will automatically generate a cycle count list for a stock keeper on a daily basis that says, here's the parts that you need to go count. And it doesn't tell them how many there are because then they can't go, yep, I got 120. It's blank and they have to go figure out how many there are. And then it comes back to the scheduling team and then they have to reconcile it, right? And so in a, in a perfect world, they come back with exactly what you have in your inventory system, right? Um, and again, so the ABC system is just an approach to say, what we want to do is, have you all heard of the 80-20 rule? Okay, so the 80-20 rule says, um, if we talked about it just in terms of customers, 80% of your revenue is probably going to come from 20% of your customers, right? And so from a standpoint of where do you want to spend the most of your time, you, you better take care of that 20% of your customers because they're 80% of your business, right? And so it's kind of that same approach here. Um, so what we do is we list our part numbers in terms of their total annual dollars, right? And then we determine, okay, What's the total percentage? So in this case, <coughs> item number 22, our annual dollar usage is $95,000. Our total dollar usage in inventory is $233,450, okay? So that's 40%. So what I'm going to do is I'm likely going to add up until I get to between 70 and 80%, and that those are going to be my eight items, okay? And then somewhere around the bottom, <coughs> what I would say 10 to 15% are going to be your C items. And it's a subjective approach when you get to the cutoff point. And a lot of times that just depends on, is the part number completely accurate? Then make it a C item, right? Or do you have trouble with that inventory? Then you make it a B item. There's some subjectiveness that comes into play there, okay? So you sort items from highest to lowest by annual dollar usage. Um, and generally, the list shows a small number of items account for large dollars and large number of items account for small dollars, okay? And so roughly A items are the top 15%, <clears throat> approximately in terms of part numbers, and about 70 to 80% of the total value. B items are roughly 35% of the items, and they're roughly 20 to 25% of the total value. And C items are roughly 50% of the items, and they represent about 5% of the value, okay? And so a lot of times what I do to determine where to make that cutoff is I'll determine my A items and I'll determine my C items and everything in between must be B, right? So it's a pretty, not, not too, too hard, all right? That being said, um, these folks have said, well, we're going to take, um, if I add up part A, or excuse me, item number 22 and 68, right, that's going to be about 83% of my total inventory, 72.9%. Okay, and then um, 
The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add up the next three part numbers, and they're going to be about 22.7% for about $53,000. And then that leaves then the bottom part numbers, again, about 50% of what's remaining of part numbers, and they're going to total up about 4.4% of total dollar spent. Okay? And then that's how you decide sure. how often you're going to inventory those items. Okay, does that make sense, the ABC approach? All right. So there's this balance. Inventory accuracy refers to how well the inventory records agree with the physical count. And cycle counting is specifically a physical inventory taking technique where the inventory is counted on a frequent basis rather than once or twice a year. Okay? All right. And one of the things is counting inventory is absolutely not a value-added activity, right? Paying somebody to go out and check something figure out your processes to make it accurate, right, then that's the approach that you want to take. Um, and probably when I first started working with staff keepers, right, I tried a lot of like positive coaching to be like, you know, we can do this, you know, let's figure it out, right. And what I found is the only thing that worked is, Kyle, you're responsible for that. And if it's not right, I'm going to write you up. Sweet. Yeah. And you know what? Kyle quit. He quit being kind to his buddies because it was his ass on the line. Right? You were like, yeah, you cannot come into my stock room and pick that up because it's me who's going to get in trouble for this. As long as it was like, Kyle, come on, we can do it. You know, we can get this. We'll, we'll get it. Let's just figure out what we need to do. There's just not as much ownership in that, right? You have to, you have to assign ownership. And then, because you as a manager cannot be on the floor all the time. It's got to be the person that's in the stock room that has to take ownership of it, okay? And so, again, I think our, our stockroom accuracy went from about 88 to 89 percent to about 98 percent with that change in, you know, well, let's, we can do this, let's figure it out, you know, what's going on to, nope, you are responsible, I'm holding you responsible, okay? So, <clears throat> all right, that's it for the lecture part of it. Um, would you like me to go over one of the Connect homework problems? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, let's right. just go with the hardest to easiest. Because <laughs> I don't know any of them. All right. If we look at 11C, well, let's look at both 11C, and I think they're set up the same way. They're basically the same thing, just two different versions of it. So <clears throat> let's see. You're given um, the information about three different ranges with three different prices. You're given the cost of place and order, annual demand, holding cost, right? All right, let's look at the next one. I think it's set up the same way. Yep, set up the same way. So again, you're given three different costs and ranges. So let's look at this one. All right. All right, so as I read this, a particular raw material is available to come at three different prices depending on the size of the order, okay? So the cost of place an order is $40, all right? So I'm going to start with Zach. Zach? Sorry, I just lost my mind over there. So Zach, what is the $40? What variable does that represent? The cost of place an order is $40, right? <coughs> just the ordering cost. Right. So if my EOQ formula is 2 times the annual demand times setup cost divided by holding cost, or holding cost would equal interest rate times cost, right? That S is $40. Okay? Ethan, annual demand is 3,000 units. What variable is that? It's D. Capital D. It's 3,000 units. <coughs> Uh, Kyle, holding or carrying cost is 25%. What what variable is that? <coughs> okay. Part of H. It's the I, uh, yeah, that one. Okay, so it's going to be I is going to equal 25%. Okay, and <coughs> so do we have what we need. We have two annual demand setup costs. Okay, where are my prices going to come from? They come from. Mm 
A war right there? Yep. So I have actually three different costs, right? I have a cost from uh, zero to 100, and that cost is $20 per pound. I have a cost from 100 to 1,000, and that is $19 a pound. And I have a cost of greater than 1,000 or 1,000 plus, right? And that's going to be $18 a pound. Okay? So the very first thing I'm going to do is I need to calculate my EOQ for each of those ranges, right? So I'm going to say EOQ from 0 to 100 is going to equal the square root of 2 times annual demand of 3,000 times the setup costs of $40, right? And I'm going to divide that by my holding cost, which is going to be my interest rate of 25% times my cost from 0 to 120, okay? I'm going to go ahead and switch over and do this in Excel. And I'll show you And so I'll real quickly uh, write down the information from McGraw-Hill. And so we said that we had, can, uh, Taylor, can you read the variables to me? I can't see them from here. Uh, S is 40, D is 3,000, I is 25%. <laughs> Zero to ninety-nine is twenty. Zero. So say zero to what? Less than hundred is twenty. Hundred is twenty. And then the next one is nineteen. And it was. Hundred to a thousand. And a thousand plus is eighteen. So see for a thousand plus is eighteen. Okay. All right. So when I calculate EOQ. Sometimes spelled EOQ, right? I'm going to take the square root of two, and I want the and I need the numerator in its own parentheses <coughs> of two times annual demand of three thousand, right? Times S of forty divided by and I need the denominator in parentheses, so it's going to be the interest rate. times the cost, right? So my EOQ is 219. So is this feasible or not feasible? Not it. It is not feasible. Yes, Adam. How do you know whether it's feasible or not feasible? Okay, because <clears throat> if EOQ comes back at 219 at that price range, mm -hmm. right? And that price range is for a range from 0 to 100, but EOQ is 219. That's outside that quantity that we can order and still get the price for, for $20. Okay. Somebody else say it a different way. Like, does it have to fall within yeah, your right. okay. Since the one 0 to 100 or 100 to 1,000? Yep, it has to fall within the range that that cost applies to. So okay. 219 is bigger than 100. So, so if it's worth more, so if the cost is more than the, uh, more than the units that you're off. Hold on, Matt, what was that? <laughs> so if the cost is higher than what you're ordering, then it's not feasible. So if the, if the, if the economic order quantity that you identify is outside the range of what the cost is applicable for, it's not feasible. Okay. So let's go ahead and do the EOQ. For the next range, okay, and so that's going to be equal to, again, the square root, and my num numerator is 2 times the annual demand of 3,000. I'm going to go ahead and fix that so I can just copy the next one down, times my setup cost of 40, and again, that doesn't change, so I can fix that. Close the parentheses on the numerator, divided by the denominator of the interest rate, and again, that doesn't change, times my cost of $19, and 
and close that parenthesis, and that's 224 or 225. So is that feasible? Yep. Adam? Yeah, yeah, I got it. You got it? That's yep. feasible? All right. And so then I'm going to do the EOQ for 1,000. And because I set the formula up, I can just copy it down. Right? And I'll just double check that. <coughs> it's two times annual demand of 3,000 times setup cost of 40 divided by interest rate of 0.25 times the cost of $18. Okay? So that is 230. So is that a feasible range? No. It's not. Okay, so am I done or do I need to look at something else? Look at something else. I need to look at something else, right? So when I go to my do my total annual costs, <coughs> right, I'm gonna go, well, this one is not feasible, but what if I ordered the minimum of a thousand? Right? Okay. So then I need to look at my total annual costs between those two to decide which one makes the most sense. Okay? So my total annual costs are equal to purchasing plus ordering plus holding. Okay? So I'm going to center these bad boys. And we're going to go, so our purchasing costs at and again, I typically give myself a little notation here. So my total annual cost at Q equal to, and go ahead and uh, let's see what it tells us here in terms of rounding. So round off to the nearest whole number. So we're going to say at Q is equal to 225, okay? And so my purchasing costs are going to be my annual demand times my cost per unit at that price. So what cost per unit am I going to use? 19, okay? My ordering costs are going to be Q divided by 2, so 225 divided by 2 times, oops, sorry, went the wrong place. My ordering costs are annual demand divided by Q, which is how many times a year I order. Annual demand of 3,000 divided by Q of 225 times the fact that it costs me $40 each time I order. My holding costs are going to be Q of 225, right, divided by 2, which is my average inventory. I'm going to multiply that times my cost per unit, which we said was 19, times the 25% interest to get my holding cost, right? And again, what you'll notice is when I add an EOQ, those two should be pretty darn close together. If I had to carry the decimal points out, they'd be even closer. Because we rounded off the whole unit, they're going to be just slightly different. Okay? So my total cost here is going to be then the sum of these three things. Okay? So then what's the other thing that I need to compare that to? Total annual cost of what? a thousand okay and again if we remember from our formula I need to replace two Q's and two U's so my purchasing price right is going to be 3,000 times what 18. times 18 because that's the price I get when I order a thousand okay my ordering costs are going to be annual demand of 3,000 divided by what Divided by a thousand because I have to order in a quantity of a thousand. That's the other place that people make mistakes. Okay? So just recognize when you're replacing your Qs, you're going back to this and you're going, okay, well, this is a Q of 225 and this is a Q of a thousand. So B3 divided by, so 3,000 divided by a thousand. Times 
times every, let's see, times every time I order, it costs me $40, right? My holding costs are going to be Q of what? 1,000. 1,000 divided by 2, because that's my average inventory, times my interest rate of 0.25 times what cost? 18. 18, right? And so you can see what happens is when we start to order 1,000, Kyle, that's that question that you were asking. My holding costs do increase dramatically over what they were before. But my guess is that the price change is probably going to compensate for those extra holding costs. Right? So 56,300 <coughs> total costs. So we'd say we would order in quantities of 1,000. What other things would you have to consider if you're going to order in quantities of 1,000? Shipping. Shipping? Typically, shipping is less the higher the volume, so that's probably going to be a plus. What's going to be the drawback? Space in your warehouse. That's it, exactly. Right? So do I have enough space to hold a 1,000 units of that? Right? If it's a small product, it's no big deal. If it's something very large, I may not have the space to do it. Right? Okay, so let's then, um, it says then, the problem asks us, well, how much would we order? Well, we would order in quantities of 1,000, and the total annual cost of that is 56,370. Let's see how we did. And we said the total annual cost of that was 56,370, okay? Sure. And your second problem is gonna be exactly that same way. The, what weird students tend to get in trouble is you wanna take shortcuts and not have to calculate the EOQs, right? And you have to go through and calculate the EOQs at all those ranges, determine what's feasible and what's not feasible and then look at the total annual cost to see uh, which is going to be your lowest total annual cost. All right? So um, we'll come back Wednesday. We'll do an exam review, and I'll answer your homework questions after class. Or, and again, I'm around during office hours, so if you have questions, stop by. Other than that, have a great couple of days, and I'll see you back here Wednesday. Well, I finished everything except what you said. Uh, yeah. It took me a while. I was messing up on the Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you finished?